All right. Well, why don't we why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so excited that you all are here. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Deborah Vagans. I'm the National Campaign Director and the Director of Equal Pay Today with Equal Rights Advocates. Thank you to those on Zoom and on Facebook um, joining us live. We are also recording this and the it'll be up on, on YouTube and you can check us out on our social channels. And um, today our statements will be on the record. So a little bit of background first. Um, Equal Pay Today is a project of equal rights advocates. We are a nationwide campaign bringing together local, state, national groups and, and thousands of supporters across the country to close race and gender wage gaps, accelerate fair pay progress state by state and drive federal policy momentum. Uh, we also organize the several equal pay days around the year to call attention to ongoing pay gaps, especially experienced by women of color. Uh, let me introduce you to my friend and guest, Rhea Fernandez, and tell you a little bit more about the Equal Pay Today executive branch policy work, and then we'll launch into a conversation with Rhea about that work. Welcome, Rhea. So Rhea Fernandez currently serves as Special Assistant to the President for Gender Policy at the White House. She was previously an Associate Counsel on the Racial Justice and Equity Team in the Office of White House Counsel. Uh, before joining the Counsel's Office, Rhea was Counsel to the Solicitor at the U.S. Department of Labor, working on civil rights and equity issues. And prior to that, Rhea served as an associate staff secretary at the White House and an attorney on the Biden-Harris transition team. And as Rhea knows, uh, my background is also as a civil rights policy expert. And we met uh, over a decade ago when we were both doing voting rights work uh, in the advocacy, advocacy community. So it's really amazing to reconnect in this space and have the opportunity to work together once again. And we are very grateful to Rhea and our friends at the White House um, Gender Policy Council for joining us here today and sharing their exciting work and our collaborations together. Um, just a little bit more background about the Equal Pay Today work. Um, Equal Pay Today published a policy agenda recently <clears throat> identifying key pieces of state and federal legislation and federal executive branch action that will address the multiple factors that contribute to the pay gap. And some of those factors include, obviously, the lack of equal pay for equal work, but also for similar work, uh, reliance on prior salary history, and the lack of pay transparency in the workplace, the failure to provide robust protections against workplace harassment and pregnancy discrimination that pushes women out of the workforce, um, occupational segregation, that is the segregation of women into underpaid work, poverty level minimum wage, rampant wage theft, and a sub-minimum wage that impoverishes tipped and other workers, and an insufficient care economy, the lack of paid family leave and paid sick days and caregiver protections, particularly in low paid work. So all of these things and more, unfortunately, decrease women's wages and economic stability. Uh, we continue to work for change in the states and in Congress and there are important actions that the administration can and has done have done as well, uh, which Equal Pay Today has prioritized and which we're going to talk a little bit about today. So let's turn to it. Welcome, Rhea. Good to be with you today. Thanks, Deb. It's so great to be here. Um, it's just really fun to um, to to be together again. We worked on trying to um, fix the. 2013 Shelby decision that eviscerated the Voting Rights Act. So um, uh, it's it's amazing to come back together to talk about women's economic security. So uh, it's, yeah, I'm, I was hoping you wouldn't date us both by saying it's been a decade since we worked together, but I guess the cat's out of the bag. But it's <laughs> nice to be here and get to join this conversation with a longtime friend and ally in this work. Oh, thank you so much. I, we haven't aged a day, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let me just jump right in. Um, so like Equal Pay Today's work, I know that the Gender Policy Council has also been really focusing on women's economic security through all the factors that, that I talked about that lead to decreased economic stability. 
Um, so maybe you could start by talking a little bit more about um, the White House Gender Policy Council for our audience and your work with them in this area, and then some of the economic security priorities uh, for the administration. Yes, of course. And thank you again for hosting this conversation. I'm so delighted to be here. And thank you for all the work that you and that Equal Pay Today is doing on these really important issues. As you note, I serve in the White House Gender Policy Council. And for those who are not as familiar, I just want to take a step back and note what a privilege it is to serve in the first ever White House Gender Policy Council. In March of 2021, President Biden established this policy council with the specific mission to advance gender equity and equality across the administration's domestic and foreign policy. And with that mandate, we are focused on three overlapping priorities, both domestically and globally. One is strengthening women's economic security, which we'll talk a lot about today. Two is preventing uh, and responding to gender-based violence. And three, advancing women's health, um, including reproductive justice. I will say all of those are intersecting and overlapping priorities. I lead our women's economic security pillar. And within that, we're focused on, I think many of these will overlap with what you just talked about, Deb, um, workplace equality, which I take to mean including pay equity, but also workplace harassment and discrimination to jobs, getting women into good jobs through all of the levers that we have, including all of the money that's going out through um, the, the big bills that the president signed last year, the Chips and Science Act, the infrastructure bill, the IRA. Uh, three, we're really focused on the care economy. I'm coming to you here just having attended the White House care convening, where we partnered with our uh, friends in the National Economic Council and the Domestic Policy Council to bring care workers and care givers to the White House. There was so much energy in that room. Um, so both supporting care workers, but and also making high quality care more affordable for families. Um, and the fourth big um, item I would put on our, our bucket list for this year um, is older women's economic security and really focusing on the needs of older women and women as they age. And as we note, and I think we'll talk about more in this conversation, is like the pay gap not only affects you in your current earnings, but in your ability to save for retirement and making sure that women as they age are, are safe and secure in their older age. So I would say those are the big buckets for me. And within all of those, we're working hand in hand with the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council, and all of our partners across the White House to make sure we're not only focused on gender issues and gender equity at the GPC, but on how all of these issues are embedded in the country's policies and across the administration. Um, so happy to pass it back to you, but that's a little bit about how we're thinking about our work here. Well, that's not a not a short list, um, as we know. And uh, uh, yes, congratulations on the, um, the big event. And I was following some of that on social, so that's fantastic. I think the way that we've thought about um, uh, thought about equal pay, you know, there's been a there's been a real evolution, and I think um, when uh, you know the first equal pay bills were passed in the 1960s, but there's been a real evolution and understanding, um, and even fields of feminist um, economics that have emerged in in those um, 60 years that we know that it's not just equal pay for equal work that decreases wages. It's all the things that keep women in low paid job that keep them, um, uh, that suppress their wages or push them out of jobs, you know, lack of, lack of care economy, lack of paid leave, uh, workplace harassment, people may uh, leave jobs um, uh, to escape abusers. There's all types of things that decrease women's wages. And you're absolutely right that um, uh, looking also at older women's economic security is important because if your pay, if you are being paid lower your whole life because of discrimination or job push out or occupational segregation, then what you have for your own um, long-term economic security or uh, intergenerational wealth or all of that is, is decreased uh, because of the discrimination. Um, so it's a real intersectional um, uh, paradigm in order to address women's economic security. Um, so I'm so glad that the White, the White House um, Gender Policy Council is looking at that it, that way as well. Um, well, let me, um, and you should feel free. We've got we've got time, so feel free to take time. Um, our audience is tuned in to hear hear what you guys have been up to. Um, for those who aren't immersed in it every day, um, I wanted to drill down a little bit. Um, two of the top priorities on Equal Pay Today's policy agenda 
are uh, banning the use of salary history and the posting of, of job ranges, um, what we generally call salary transparency. Um, for salary bans in particular, a reason why we advocate for this is because if the employer sets current wages by using your prior wages, then even a well-intentioned employer can carry forward uh, a salary level that might have been tainted by discrimination in a prior job and can further continue the underpaying of women and, and workers of color. Um, and the posting of job ranges is important for a lot of reasons. And we, I won't, I, people didn't come here to hear me talk, so I'll try to, to uh, I'll be very quick. Yeah, but the yeah. posting of job ranges <clears throat> is also important because it's a way to help reduce uh, bias seeping into salary setting if you're really tying pay ranges more intentionally and publicly to the duties and expectations of a job. Um, so as you know, uh, and our audience knows, the Paycheck Fairness Act, and there's also an, a bill uh, called the Salary Transparency Act. They're both pending federal bills pending in Congress. If those were to pass, um, then it would ban the use of salary history and requiring the posting of pay ranges for all workers. But until we can get those passed, um, the president um, has exercised the power to do it or begin the process to do it for millions of federal workers and government contractors. So I'm hoping you could talk a little bit more, um, starting with the executive orders that led to this and the subsequent rulemaking. Um, and for our audience, I will flag, so you don't have to say it, that I, I do understand that the rulemaking is open still for the federal contractor. So I, I, I understand that maybe some of what you can say can be different for the federal civilians and the federal contractors. Thanks so much, Deb. And I'll start by saying you were in the room this past January when we celebrated the 15th anniversary of the signing of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And Lilly zoomed in to join us. And on that day, we were able to announce some of our own pay equity initiatives. But it was really impactful. And I thought what, what struck me most is many of the women in the administration who opened remarks that day talked about how this had personally affected them, the use of salary history um, can follow you from job to job. And so this has been um, the idea of, you know, creating mechanisms for pay equity has been a day one priority. In March of 2021, the president signed an executive order on diversity, equity, and inclusion, in which he directed the Office of Personnel Management to issue regulations on to promote pay equity in the federal workforce, because we know we need to start with making the federal government a model employer. And so what we did this past year on January in January of 2024 was to finalize that rule. And it ends the use of salary history in pay setting decisions um, for for non federal um, when you're coming into the federal government from a non federal job. And so, as you say, that's really important for curbing pay discrimination that can follow workers from job to job. And it ensures that salaries are set based on the applicant's skills, experience, and expertise, because we know that relying on salary history isn't always the best mechanism for making sure that you're finding the best worker and that you're tying their new salary to what their worth actually is. So um, relying on a candidate's previous salary history exacerbates these pre-existing inequalities and it disproportionately impacts women and workers of color. And so I think what we're doing with this new regulation is setting a new standard that demonstrates we're committed to attracting the best talent. Um, and as you noted, you know, I think when you're coming from public service into the federal government versus coming from the private sector, you can actually be penalized if we're relying on salary history. And so this is one where we're saying we're working on attracting the best talent and we're, we want to value people who have worked in public service before as well. So this is going to help close gender and racial pay gaps and attract talent um, that we can retain to make sure that we, are, uh, we have a sort of a qualified uh, federal workforce. Um, is could you talk a little bit more about the the implementation on the for the for I know that it has the rulemaking has gone into effect. Do you know when the um, the I know it takes time for the federal government to to make personnel changes. Do you know anything more about the implementation for the um, the ban on salary history for the federal civilian workforce? Yes, and sorry, and I didn't mean to dodge your question about the uh, the Federal Acquisition nope. Regulatory Council because I oh, do want I'll to come back to that. that. I'll, I'll ask you a few questions uh, about the Federal Civilian Workforce, and, and then about the importance of salary um, wage range disclosures as well. Sorry, no, uh, I, I'll keep going. But yeah, no, but it was it, the rule is effective. It was effective sixty days from finalization, and so OPM is providing guidance to federal agencies on how to implement that. But that means going forward, people. Um, 
people's salary history cannot be considered in pay setting decisions. So uh, that is that work is in progress and we're working closely with our friends at OPM to make sure uh, that it's carried out throughout the federal agencies. And I wanted to circle back to your point about the, the importance of wage range disclosures, which I know is something that's, that you all have been advocating for as well. And uh, I think about this, if someone once said to me, you would never walk into a house and not know how much it costs. And someone say to you, like, how much would you pay for this? And you just pull a number out of out of the thin air. And so I think when you were walking into a job, a lot of times people say, well, how much do you expect to be paid knowing nothing a priori about what the job would pay you? And they actually have the best information about what they should pay you. And so we know that when workers don't know what they are, what they should be asking for, that tends to also exacerbate inequalities. And by posting these job salary ranges online, people know they can negotiate better, they're coming in with fuller information, and it sort of, you know, decreases the asymmetries and in information that that workers may have coming into a job negotiation. So uh, that is one of the requirements in the um, proposed rule that the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council has put out for federal contractors. Yeah, I mean, it's so true. I, I um, people, it's, it's such a part of our culture that people in job applications will say, what are your salary expectations? And, but you're right, the, the, all the information is with the employer and this better, you know, this reduces, as you said, that asymmetry um, because you don't have anything necessarily, if there's nothing to peg it to, except maybe your own experience or your own salary history rather than the duties of the job, which is what we want to have to eliminate bias and make sure we're getting all the, the best candidates. Um, because you, the whole point would be that if you're using your prior salary history yourself, uh, or you disclose that to the employer and they're using your, 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 um, your prior salary history to then set that range, um, they could have bring in all the baggage of prior discrimination, but this way, if the job ranges are posted, then you know. Um, you know, we've also seen some data that um, it does help in negotiation, but we've also seen some data that shows that that there's backlash when women negotiate salaries too, and so this can um, help create more narrow ranges that can also um, streamline the process and potentially reduce all of the bias in the hiring and job setting, uh, pay setting process. Um, so it's fantastic about the, the government contractors. And the reason I think, and I'm gonna turn it back to you, the reason we're talking about that in the government contracting, uh, why that's part of the rule in government contracting is for the, the ban for the federal civilian workforce. The federal civilian workforce already has job ranges that are, you know, pay ranges that are, when you apply for a, a job with federal government. Um, so- right. And I think this is one of the ways in which the federal government already is the leader in this space where we, you know, for however many years that this has already become public. And that is um, not, not one of the things that we needed to require in the new rule going forward because it's already public sort of what each band in the GS level is and that folks sort of know going in how much how much they would expect to be making in a job. Right, and the, and the federal government has one of the, uh, smallest pay gaps, pay gap still exists, but it has one of the smallest pay gaps um, when you uh, when you look across, you know, when we look at the pay gaps across other industries and when you look at the overall equal payday uh, pay gaps, when we talk about for women overall or for black women or Latinas, uh, when you look at working just in the federal government, the wage gap is pretty small and that's due in large part to the transparency, transparency that already exists, right? You've got the, the pay ranges up and now you'll have the uh, added benefit of reducing the, or eliminating the, the use of prior salary history. Um, so. Uh, right, like if you look at the trajectory from um, Director Huja mentioned this when she rolled out this um, regulation in January of looking from 1992 to the present, I think we made such great strides in closing that gap, which is now closer to, to 6%. And I think that, you know, obviously there should be no percent, it should be, there should be no gender wage gap, but I think this will bring us even further to, to closing that in. And um, is there anything more that you could say about um, uh, the federal contracting rule or the, I, I realize that that is still open. We had equal pay today, um, submitted comments. We had many of our viewers, we had many, you know, 
over 40 organizations join us in supporting what the administration was trying to do. Um, anything that you can talk about with respect to that or why it was important to the administration to, to put out this proposed rule? Right, and well, I'll, I'll take us back to in March of 2022, the president issued an executive order um, asking the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council in conjunction with the Department of Labor to look into whether or not, you know, you, pay transparency measures would increase the economy efficiency and effectiveness of the federal contracting workforce. And what the rule, the proposed rule, which came out in January said was actually relying on all the things that Deb, you just mentioned that, you know, by disclosing compensation up front, employers can lower recruiting costs and um, they, you know, it helps the negotiation process. So it's actually beneficial for federal contractors to have these rules in place. And that ultimately helps the um, federal government with its the economy and efficiency and effectiveness in their um, in the federal contracting workforce and it's better for the federal government in those contracting negotiations. And so I will say the proposed rule is still there. It has not yet been finalized. Um, but what I think the president had directed and what the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council found in its proposed rule is that that when we ban the use of salary history and that when we make wage range disclosures public, it not only helps workers, but it also helps business. And it will ultimately, you know, eliminating discrimination is good and efficient also for the for the workforce. That's a very, very good point that um, the you know, you ha underwriting, having the federal government funds and federal government contractors who have contracts with the government underwriting, you know, discrimination even unintentionally, which some of these things are, right? If you're carrying forward decisions based on prior setting, right? That is, undermines the efficiency of the um, contracting process and the, you know, the economic efficiency of the process and uses federal dollars to underwrite discrimination. And so obviously that's something that we, we, we don't want to be doing. And I, I think, you know, this is about equity, but it's also about the efficiency and effectiveness of the federal contracting workforce. And so to your point, I think when when both of those things work together, um, that's that's even better. And I'll say none of this, um, you know, means that we, we still need the Paycheck Fairness Act and we're still, yes. the president is still calling on Congress to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act and all of those measures are still incredibly important. But I think both of these rules by banning the use of salary history and in the federal contracting space requiring uh, wage range disclosures will, will make huge strides in terms of pay equity. Yes, thank you so much for saying that. That is, it is very true. I mean, there's a long history in our country where um, there have been civil rights bills, pieces of legislation uh, where, you know, we have the not yet been able to get them through Congress, but the president has used their um, executive order authority to move the country forward on civil rights and gender justice and racial justice. So yes, we need many of these things to to be passed in federal legislation so that that your rights don't are not determined by your zip code. But until that day, um, it's uh, it's there's a long history in this country for the presidents to be able to move forward what they can. Uh, for this federal civilian workforce or the federal contracting workforce. And if these both will, one, the federal civilian one is already done, but if, you know, this will reach uh, when both rules are finalized, if both rules are finalized, um, this can reach millions and millions of workers. Um, but it's a very good call out um, about uh, us continuing our advocacy work. And as I mentioned, there's the uh, Equal Pay Today policy agenda, which does exactly that. It talks about list some bills at the federal level, the state level, and a federal executive branch, all of which, any of which would be helpful. And we're, we're grateful as they move forward and grateful to the community for continuing to um, keep this in the public consciousness. Um, well, let me, I know we've, we've, we've got time. Um, so I'm going to ask you another question. And then I might want to revisit um, some of the some of the things that you've talked about at the, in the beginning in your first question about your four priorities. Um, but let me let me ask you this because we've talked we've talked about it in a couple in the couple of the questions so far. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, as we, you've talked about the pay gaps for women of color um, and most economic indicators are worse uh, uh, are are worse for them than for women overall. Um, I'm wondering if you could address specifically some of the administration's work implementing changes to improve the economic security for women of color. 
Thanks for that question. I think this is so important and it's at the heart of everything we're thinking about, not just at the Gender Policy Council, but across the White House and across the administration. When you opened up, we were talking about what are the drivers of the wage gap? And I think we've sort of laid them out a little bit in these three buckets. One is outright discrimination, two, occupational segregation, the overrepresentation of women and people of color in occupations and industries that pay less, and their underrepresentation in occupations and industries that pay more. Um, and three, sort of the caregiving responsibilities. And I would say in each of those three categories, they women of color are disproportionately feeling the burdens of all of those. And I'll just touch on occupational segregation to begin with, which is to say, we're thinking about that in two ways, both by valuing the jobs that women are in more and bringing women into good jobs. And so thinking, again, I'm thinking about the care event that I was at today, um, and there was such energy in the room for talking about you know, the president said earlier this week, caregivers are the best of who we are as Americans. And I believe that that to be true as well. And I saw so many of them in the room today. And yet their work is so undervalued um, in, in, in so many ways. And so I think what we've really done last year on April of 2023, the president issued an executive order with more than 50 directives to every cabinet level agency trying to incentivize them to ensure that we're boosting wages for better, for caregivers and care workers um, and to make care more affordable. And so I think when we're valuing jobs that women and women of color disproportionately do, like caregiving, that is one way in which we are you know, ensuring that women we're closing that gap for women of color. And then the bringing women into good jobs, and I think we referenced this earlier as well, um, across the administration, we're thinking about ways that um, women are getting good paying union jobs. And um, Secretary Raimondo, when she rolled out the Chips and Science Act um, announcement said, you know, we're going to require um, um, folks that are looking for money from, from the Department of Commerce to have a child care requirement for their workers. And I think things like that are so meaningful when you're asking women to come into good jobs, having that care care taken care of so they're not having to leave their jobs for caregiving responsibilities. So I think all of these things are intertwined and women of color are sort of at the center of all of these sort of issues that we're talking about of what um, women disproportionately face, um, but they're at the center of how we're thinking about the solutions as well. And I'll say in the caregiving um, responsibilities piece, um, You'll, the Department of Labor came out with a great report recently that I would uh, you know, recommend to everyone, both talking about occupational segregation, but also talking about how much larger the wage gap is for mothers, right? And so those, were, those losses that you have in your lifetime, um, it, they start when you're maybe caregiving to your child at one point in life, but then that adds up over the cost of a lifetime and you never totally recoup those costs. So thinking about how we may ensure that people have access to paid family and medical leave, right? When they need it or other, or have care um, available to them. And so I think those are all, all the things are interconnected and you'll see the president has called for a national paid family and medical leave um, program in his budget uh, that was rolled out last month. And uh, that's another way in which we're hoping, you know, we want to support uh, women staying in the workforce when they, when they can and not to lose, to have that gap be exacerbated over the course of their lifetime. Yeah. You, you said a lot in there. That's uh, there's a, the, and you are completely correct about the intersection, which is what we were what we were trying to um, flesh out very quickly in our policy agenda, as well as in this call today, that it's not just one thing or another thing that affects it. So, um, right. So there's the lack of there's the occupational segregation. So women segregated into the lower paid fields. Um, even within the lower paid fields, if you look at data, women still make less than when men are in those fields. I mean, it's so there's lack of equal pay, there's the occupational segregation in these very low paid jobs. And so it's both about creating equal pay and giving um, economic mobility so that women can reach these better paid jobs from the, the infrastructure, the, you know, the chips, all of that, the massive investment that's been put into our infrastructure for better jobs. So having pathways um, to get to those. And once you are in those, that the pay is, then there are protections for equal pay. You also talked about um, the need for caregiver protections and paid leave. So people, I mean, we often bat around these phrases, but the real idea is if, if you don't have paid leave, you might have to quit your job in order to take care of your family. And that obviously immediately decreases your wages, but it interrupts your job path, your 
job security. There's the connection of these are inextricably linked, but I don't know that. Um, so it's important for us to combat them all together. Um, and, and, you know, you talked about moms. Um, we Equal Pay Day also has a, a mom's equal pay day that looks at the difference between moms and dads. And there's also clearly a pay gap there. And the other thing that um, uh, many researchers have documented is there's also something called the motherhood penalty that uh, women, whether they are mothers or not, there's a presumption that they could become mothers. They're offered less. They're given less in promotions, less in raises overall. Their starting salaries are less because of bias, thinking that they will step out of the workforce uh, to become moms, or they might be less committed to the jobs. Whereas you see something called the fatherhood bonus, um, which is men often make more as they become fathers. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any more from the, um, from the work that you've been doing this week that you wanted to talk about that relate to any of those, but we'd certainly love to hear it. No, that, and thank you for elaborating on that. I think that that's all right. Um, the one point I wanted to come back to was just um, as we were talking about occupational segregation, it, it reminded me that the Department of Labor, the Women's Bureau put out a report last month on Equal Pay Day um, called Bearing the Cost. And it's a report about the impacts of occupational segregation on women, particularly women of color. And their report found that Black women lost $42.7 billion and Hispanic women $53.3 billion in wages compared to white men due to the impacts of occupational segregation. And so it's numbers like that that sort of blow you away where you think about, you know, women being, you know, in jobs that are undervalued, as you say, and sort of being shut out of jobs where compensation is higher. The costs are real for so many people over the course, and it adds up over the course of a lifetime. Yeah, it's, and I think there's research, I don't have it at the tip of my fingers about like, what would be contributed to the economy if women were paid equally? I think it's in the billions. I think I've seen a trillion somewhere. I, I don't wanna I don't want to misquote it, but it's just the numbers are just um uh, sort of earth shattering if all wages were brought up for for women, what that would then contribute back to the economy. And I think we've sort of talked about two things that are related that you know, there's um, sometimes there's opposition to this work because there's a sense that uh, it's not good for business or it's it's em employer won't help employers. But I think we've talked about that um, having an efficient workforce or hiring with with less bias is is benefited when you have more pay transparency processes or if you are paying people fairly, the economy overall is, is going to benefit from the additional uh, um uh, wages that are diff the additional money that's put into the economy because of increased uh, wages. So there's a lot of um, reasons we should all be working together on this. Right. I think that's exactly right. And, and one of the things that I the president talks about care as an economic issue and pay equity is an economic issue, right? I think these are, as we heard today um, and on Tuesday when he spoke at the care rally, I think lifting up care workers and ensuring that our care economy is working for our country. We can't have the best economy in the world unless we have the best care economy in the world. And I think that that's something um, that is, I'm also echoing in this pay equity space. And when we see the proposed rule that came out um, for federal contractors, it, it's about creating efficiencies in the federal contracting workforce as well. And so I think to your point, these are decisions that are, are good for business. And a lot of the research that was referenced in that proposed rule is about the fact that when workers have hired have, are, are set in a job that has a better match because their, their, their salary history hasn't been used and they were recruited based on skills and talent um, and their prior work history, they maybe have a better fit for the job, they stay longer, they have higher job satisfaction, there's less turnover. And so I think all of these things are interconnected in a way that actually benefits um, businesses and the economy overall. That's very true. And it even like starting at the very beginning, if you're you're talking about getting the best candidates, if you're applying for a job, I mean, there are many people who will breeze past a posting that doesn't have the job range. You don't know if it's what you need for yourself or your family or your experience level. Um, I know, you know, in the civil rights community, sometimes people won't even share job postings that don't have job ranges, for example. There's lots of reasons why employers would want to be competing, competing in a transparency uh, on a transparency level for candidates. So, so all that is, all that is true. Um, and, you know, I had the, the pleasure of 
working for a prior administration, uh, a couple couple administrations ago, and um, there was the White House uh, employer, the White House um, Employer Pay Equity um, Council and Employers for Pay Equity. Um, and there were many employers that joined that. It was under the Obama administration um, that wanted to gather and talk about their internal practices and policies and um, uh, and 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 why they thought that these that these sorts of changes were important. And um, and so I do think, you know, if there's one one message out there, I think one of the messages we've said today is that these sorts of economic security reforms are interconnected and they're all uh, address different aspects of women's economic security and all different reasons why wage gaps are depressed. I think that's one one lesson we're talking about here. I think the other is that um, these are these are policies that are good for business, and um, uh, and there's many reasons why people will need to compete in this new age of uh, when uh, when employees expect more. They they expect more than maybe when I was coming up. <laughs> right, or now we know what to expect for ourselves. <laughs> Because like a job is more than a paycheck. And I think what people really want is to feel valued. And so, and, you know, to come to their jobs with dignity um, right. and, and to bring it to care. I think this is one of the things that people see this, this, this as a profession and they need to be paid as if it is a profession. And I think we need to, to bring, um, to make sure that people are feeling valued in their jobs, whether it's by eliminating, you know, discriminatory pay, pay practices, as we've been talking about today, um, or sort of boosting, boosting wages in overall sectors that are, that are undervalued. Right. Yeah. And, and on that last point about, um, uh, you know, I've heard this quote that we, you know, we pay more, we pay people more in this, um, in the economy to watch cars and to watch children. I don't, I hope that is no longer the case, right? So we pay people who are working with cars more than people who are working with children. And hopefully that is no longer the case, especially with this investment in the, in the care economy. But there are also, you know, there's, we talked about pieces of federal legislation. There's another piece of federal legislation called the um, Fair Pay Act, and that addresses occupational segregation. So it says that there should be equal pay for, um, um, for similar work, right? Not saying that those two are similar, but um, if you look at, for example, um, 911 dispatchers um, uh, versus um, fire dispatchers, you know, there's some uh, um, occupational segregation there and some wage gaps there, but those are similar jobs. You know, I'm just, again, making, make, giving examples sort of anecdotal, but the idea is that if women are, um, if there's occupational segregation and that field is lower, maybe we should really be thinking hard about what is that similar to? And if there's a male dominated field, that's very similar. Why is that male dominated field making more? Um, well, so I'm, I know we're wrapping up now. Um, I, I've enjoyed this. It's been a little bit more of a free flowing, you know, fireside chat. So thank you, Rhea. Um, I, there... I hope I'll take it as a compliment. I don't know it, if that's. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, it's been fun. And, um, I really, it's been, it's very, it's very, um, I think it's affirming for our community to, to hear from an administration that understands how complex these issues are, how intersecting they are, um, the intersectional discrimination that that women of color are facing, and therefore the answers have to be um, are there's just not one size fits all. Um, so that's um, really important for folks to hear about. Um, I, in, you know, in wrapping up, I just wanted to give you back the floor. Is there anything else that you would like to talk about or mention that you might not have had an opportunity to to address? Um, well, th just thank you so much for having me. Thank you for um, lifting up these really important issues. I think everything that we touched upon today from occupational segregation to care to these executive orders uh, and the rules implementing the banning of the use of salary history and pay transparency are so important both to the Gender Policy Council, but to the president himself, who since day one, as I said, has cared about and dedicated um, multiple executive orders and, and issued um, multiple executive orders 
to, to think about the importance of pay equity um, across the administration and the federal contracting workforce. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that today. But as you say, all of these issues are interconnected. And I think as we think about women's economic security and the coming year and what we have um, left to do here, um, it really is about making sure that we're we're centering women and women of color in this conversation and, and being responsive to, to sort of the needs that are there. And so look forward to continuing this um, moving forward. Well, thank you, Ria. And so I definitely want to, so I want to thank you. Um, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise today. I want to thank the Gender Policy Council and, and Jen Klein and your, the amazing team there. Um, and I also want to thank the Equal Rights Advocates Communications team who are behind the scenes now making sure that this is all working. And thank you for all and making sure the webinar looks so beautiful. And obviously to the Equal Pay Today Coalition, as well as folks joining us on Zoom and um, Facebook Live and later YouTube for your collective work on all of these issues. We're very grateful. We can't make change if we're not doing it together. Um, so thank you all for tuning in and hope you have a good rest of the week. Thanks, Deb.